Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, 16 through 17. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Here ends the reading. Thank you. Um, Bev, could you please mute your cell phone? We'd appreciate that. Thank you. Our second scripture is from the book of Exodus in the 20th chapter, beginning at the eighth verse. This is the longest of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Here ends our scripture. So I have preached about keeping the Sabbath and keeping it holy for many years, at least once a year in the 14 or 15 years since I was ordained. Now, this message has often been a reminder to the congregation and to myself that many of us have become enamored of work, grow up valuing work above most things, and find it difficult, if not impossible, to take a whole 24 hours off of work every week. Now, whether the work is in paid money or other rewards, many have learned to base our self-worth on work, activity that is creative, that produces something, or that ex exercises our dominion or control over our environments. Now, of course, the definitions of work to vary depending on the individual and religious traditions. Jewish traditions for Sabbath keeping vary by tradition and even by rabbi. Some common Orthodox Provisions include no cooking, driving, turning on electricity from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday. Conservative and reformed congregations and individuals bring their own interpretations of what constitutes Sabbath and what constitutes work and what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. And congregational Christians in New England for the first few centuries on this continent generally observed quite strict Sabbaths. If you go back to the handwritten records that most congregational churches have or have copies of still, you will see meetings where people were brought up on charges before the congregation for working or failing to attend sometimes day-long church services on the Sabbath. Blue laws for what can and cannot be sold on the Sabbath have largely been changed, but they still cast their shadows on retail stores in Connecticut. And in recent decades, our world has changed significantly in so many ways, including for many, the feasibility of keeping a common day, 
like all together in the society keeping a single day as a Sabbath. Some of us thought, well, that might have been fine for Moses and the Israelites. That might have been fine when this church was built or even for our grandparents. But we, we live in a different world. I mean, Moses wasn't expected to bring his smartphone with him up onto Mount Sinai. William Brewster's kids weren't expected to play soccer on Sundays. And he wasn't expected to check email constantly, even on the weekends. But this year is different. This year, I'm wondering how these two and a half years of pandemic have changed our notion of and receptivity to the concept of Sabbath. Now, just this week, the nation's employment rate has returned to levels that were attained before this scourge began. So have attitudes toward work and rest changed? Or will we just simply reset to the way we operated in January 2020? Many of us who were employed for pay when the pandemic hit found ourselves underemployed or unemployed or working much differently and worshiping much differently. Others had their retirements reshaped by a cessation of volunteer activities and other shared interests that face-to-face -face connected us to one another. But enforced restrictions are not the same as the observance of a Sabbath voluntarily. In fact, while many of us were for a time less busy, for me at least, the days seemed to dissolve into this sameness that made it difficult to know what day of the week it was, let alone to set one aside from all the others. And yet Jesus did, quite often, set aside days for rest. His flexibility in the face of legalistic restrictions got him in trouble with the religious authorities of his day, but he did rest. He went to the wilderness. He went to friends' houses and was served. He encouraged his disciples when they were exhausted to come away to a deserted place and rest a while. So perhaps this pandemic time, or for some maybe getting into post-pandemic time, called or calls us to find a different way of Sabbath keeping. What is restful and restorative to our souls now? When the whole world seemed to slow down, did Sabbath keeping mean slowing down as well or finding other ways of marking time, connection, worship, and the love of God that we so desperately needed and need? And as some of us return, however quickly, slowing, slowly or haltingly, to lives that are more like they were several years ago, maybe we have an opportunity to examine what has been beneficial to our souls during what for many has been a devastating time to realize that even in extreme difficulty, there can be invitation and renewal. I don't believe that God causes harm to us, but I do believe that out of the worst, God can bring good if we are receptive to it. So what good has come out of this time and what do we have an opportunity to hold on to? 
when we keep a Sabbath holy in whatever way honors God and rests our souls, we remember that now, even now, God frees us. The Ten Commandments were for freedom. God frees us from the demands of the world one day each week. Some of us work on Sundays. There may be another day. There may be a week when it's not possible, but to find periods in which you set aside time, put it on your calendar if you have to, to be still, to rest, and to know that God is God and we are not. We remember during Sabbath that we are not measured in God's eyes, or nor should we be in our own by how much we produce or how admired we are or by any other human metric. We learn humility. Who knew that the world can actually do without our efforts for a day? So this commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, remember it's a commandment, not a recommendation, actually then becomes an invitation to freedom. Freedom to appreciate the world that God has made for us, freedom to just be the people that God has created us to be. Maybe We'd like it better if we called it the fourth invitation, a personal invitation. And this mid to late summer time when our schedules are a little less crowded, perhaps, maybe this is the time to accept that and to really live into it and try it out. We have the freedom to accept it or not. The difference. The difference may be priceless, it may be timeless, it may be peace-filled and joyful and restful and holy. I wish it for you, I wish it for me, I wish it for all God's children. Amen. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the spirit of truth, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, Shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. O oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me. Touch thou my longing eyes, that I may see. Give me to eat and live with thee above. Touch me to love thy truth, for thou art love.